I'd like to begin this morning by reading a very, very simple yet profound passage. It's Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Revelation 14, it was a part of our scripture reading this morning. These are the people who will be ready for Jesus to come. And uh, these will be your neighbors in heaven. Revelation 14, verse 12. This is at the very conclusion of the three angel messages. And here's what it says. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I'm talking about the faith of Jesus this morning. Uh, It doesn't say faith in Jesus. It says the faith of Jesus. It's it's a noun, not a verb. It's a noun. (laughs) And uh, it's uh, an important and locate, that text is located in a very important part here. It comes right at the conclusion of the three angel messages. And presumably these people have heeded the message of three angels. That's why they keep God's commandments. That is why they have this kind of faith. God's end time message. Three angels. Readying a people for the advent. That's the all important, the all consuming thing that times we're living in, Right? Be ready for Jesus to come. How many want people want to be ready for Jesus to come? How many want to be ready for Jesus to come if you're not ready? <laughs> it's a different story, isn't it? So what does the faith of Jesus look like in the life of believers? Where does it come from? Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. It comes by hearing the word of God. He's the author of our faith. Ephesians 1.3 says that every spiritual blessing comes in Christ. We receive it in him. We receive nothing from him apart from him. That, that's really kind of separating from him. We receive those blessings in him, not from him. Otherwise, we go off and do our thing. But we receive them in and We're saved in the person of another. That's an important idea, I think. In him, that expression is used again and again in the writings of Paul. The personal faith of of these end-time believers is called the faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus. It was the personal connection that Jesus had with his Father that God wants us to have as well. That faith was renewed every morning afresh as he meditated upon the character of his father. And as a result, he wants to share it with us. Jesus didn't even need an alarm clock in the morning. Uh, This was in our Sabbath school lesson this week. It's just a coincidence. I don't think there are any coincidences, though. Do you think so? Isaiah chapter 50, verse 12. I'm sorry, verses 4 and 5. Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5. Let's look at it. It says, the Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh me morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord hath opened mine ear. And I was not, what does the next word say? I was not rebellious. This is a messianic prophecy. He had such a communion with his father that he was not rebellious. Neither turned away back. Why was Jesus not rebellious? Because his eyes and ears were tuned to the father. Jesus learned to know the father as a result. And it was a it was a painful process for Jesus. Um, Hebrews chapter five. Verses eight and nine. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. And notice the pathos in, as, as the writer Paul talks about this. It says, though he were a son, capital S-O-N, yet he learned obedience by the things which he, what does it say? Suffered. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. 
So obedience is the opposite of rebellion. Jesus learned to know the Father as we can all learn to know him. He knew him and he loved him. To know him is to love him. He never stumbled into rebellion because he knew the Father. This was not an easy pathway for Jesus in a world of rebellion. All around him was rebellion. Actually, it was midnight, spiritually, in the history of the world when Jesus appeared on the scene. Uh, We're approaching that kind of a time again, by the way. When Jesus comes, it'll be like midnight again, like midnight darkness. And we can quickly see the clouds of darkness beginning to cover the earth. Why was it not easy road for Jesus? Because his connection with his Father and the Holy Spirit bore fruits in his life, fruits of righteousness in a world of rebellion. Righteousness rubbed against the rebellion in the world that was in the world in that day. Rebellion cannot stand in the presence of righteousness. And those fruits of righteousness were so unique and fresh and full of love that they got him into lots of trouble. Almost every day. I think we could probably say every day as you read the Gospels. Often they sought out to kill him. They tried to seek him out and kill him, right? And he got into lots of trouble. And when the test came, Jesus survived that supreme temptation because of that faith, connection that he had had with his father heretofore. See him there in the Garden of Gethsemane as his fingers clutch into the dirt and, he, and, and, it, and, and it's, a, it's a scene of, of, of pathos and, and um, extreme sorrow. And uh, the reason he was to, able to go through that awful hour was because of the, of the connection that he had with his father the relationship he had with his father heretofore, beforehand. Does that say something to us at all? The final test came in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, not my will, but what? Thy will be done. Jesus, was, as always, was perfectly willing to be in harmony with the will of his father, in that he was obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. Jesus promised in the covenant that he would Forgive every repentant sinner. Wow, that's me. And that's all of us here today. And that's the whole world of people. That's 60 centuries of earth people. He promised the human family that he would forgive every repentant sinner. And he looked down the centuries and his heart was tender toward us too. I believe he saw us sitting here this morning and the needs that we have. Notice how the Bible describes his unselfish obedience to the covenant. Actually, the covenant is everything. Um, None of us are saved apart from the covenant, by the way. But Jesus made a promise to us. It's found in Philippians chapter 3. Sorry, chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. Philippians 2, 7 to 9. You have it? And he may, and may, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, humbled, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. He was obedient to the Father's law because he knew the Father. And to know the Father as he did is to love him like he did. He loved the Father because he knew the Father. You can't love anything or anyone unless you know them, right? He had firsthand knowledge of the Father. The Father's law says, thou shalt not bear false witness. And he was obedient. He didn't tell us a lie when he made that covenant with us. Obedient even unto death. He kept the covenant promise. Jesus could say after all was said and done, I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. Isn't that a neat phrase? I have kept my Father's commandments. You know, the Bible says that love is the fulfillment of the law. It all is based on love. In fact, in that passage in, in uh, Romans, 13, Romans 13, it says that 
it mentions some of the commandments, some of the Decalogue. It's, it states them and then it says that, uh, you know, love is the fulfillment of the law. The Father's love in the Father's care. That was the very atmosphere he breathed. In fact, I read someplace that was the very atmosphere of heaven. None but those who have fortified their minds with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great, great conflict. Now, Jesus had a last great conflict, and he purchased our salvation. And none of us will go through that conflict unless we have fortified our minds like he did with a word. Faith comes by hearing. What are the precious truths of the Bible that fit us to have the faith of Jesus when the time comes? These are the revelation, these truths are the revelation of God's character. I remember reading someplace that the last message of mercy to go out to the world is a message, is a revelation of God's character. What is God like? The world still waits to hear that message. It's the centerpiece of the last message of mercy to the world. What God is really like and what his character is. You know, to know that is to, is to know him, is to love him. The people of planet Earth will be ready for his coming only on the basis of knowing him. To know Jesus is eternal life. The way Jesus abode in the character of his Father through faith in him is how we too can abide in his love and his character. Our journey is a faith journey. You know that Christianity is the only faith religion in the whole wide world. Which faith is the faith of Jesus? And uh, when this is our abode, if this is where we live, the fruits of righteousness will burst out forth in our lives as well. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one every day, any day, right? You know that little phrase? Um, the fruits of righteousness will burst out in our lives in a most innocent and unselfish manner. Titus 2, 11 to 14. Please turn with me. That's a little book just before Hebrews. Titus. Chapter 2. This is a, is a very interesting little passage. It says, starting with verse 11. Titus 2, starting with verse 11. Just a little book. As you're making your way through the Bible here, if you blink, you'll miss it. Titus 2, verse 11. I want to read down through verse 14. It says... For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Let me ask you a question. What is the grace of God that brings salvation? The gospel, isn't it? The gospel. Grace is the sheer, unadulterated mercy of God. So the, for the grace of God that brings salvation, that is the gospel, has appeared to how many people? All men. All men. Everyone has a chance. Somewhere in their life. There is a voice that speaks to them. Uh, and sometimes he uses people to carry that voice, right? Teaching us. What does the gospel teach us now? Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. How much iniquity? All. all iniquity. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Jesus is looking for a portrait in us. Have you read that before? Yeah. These ideas are, are really encased in the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. That's what your neighbors will look like in heaven. This is how we witness to others. These kinds of people will be your neighbors. 
For they also will abide in God's love because of faith, because of the faith of Jesus. The characters of true believers will be more and more matched the life of Jesus as we go along. Sanctification is the work of a what? A lifetime, every day, learning to know him better, surveying his character, and then we'll fall in love with him. We need to fall in love with Jesus, right? It's possible, I believe, to spend so much time telling people how they ought to live, picking fruit, if you will, in the congregation, spend so much time doing that that we don't, that we don't have time to look to Jesus and know him. But the end result of knowing Jesus is simply this. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. These dear ones keep God's commandments. Obediently from the heart, because love is a thing of the heart that has been reached for by the hand of faith. And the Holy Spirit opens heaven's storehouse. We know that little statement, prayer is the key in the what? In the hand of faith. Faith is likened to a hand that reaches out for Christ's righteousness every day. These dear ones have been slaves to God's word and as a result they are God's friends. Reflectors of his character of love. God says, here are they that keep the commandments of God. Now, you know, that begs a, that maybe begs, begs a question. Can we kind of picture in our minds the devil asking the Lord in the end time, where are the people that really love you? Where are they? And the Lord can look at his people and say, here are they <laughs> that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You can do anything you want to them, like poor old Job, but you can't take their life in that last remnant of time. And they'll stand uh, true. Faith and works are cause and effect. Faith is the cause of obedience, right? Cause and effect, evidence of faith. Notice the clear words in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Uh, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Clear words here. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. It says, For by grace, there's that word again. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not, not of yourselves, it is a what? It is a gift. God gives us gifts, rich gifts. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now I can understand that, can't you? We can understand that. Not of works. We don't gain acceptance by God by our good living, our, our good, by, by, by being good livers. Morris Venden used that expression. Good livers. <laughs> okay. That's not how we gain acceptance with God. But notice verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Works are a fruit of our faith, right? They're the fruit of our giving our hearts to Jesus every day and, and, and living in him. There will be good works. If there's not good works, there's an evidence that we don't know Jesus, Right? These are clear words. So I want to talk about these four elements here for a moment. Grace, the unfettered, raw love of God for us. It's the source of our, all of our, of, our, uh, of our hopes and joys. Grace is the source. God's grace is the source of all true heart religion. It proceeds from God's heart to our hearts by the Holy Spirit's work. The second one is faith. Faith is the method. Now, grace is the source, right? It comes from the heart of God. Faith is the method. Faith is the hand. Prayer is the hand that reaches forth and takes hold of God's righteousness. Faith is the method. It's like the hand that reaches out to God and opens heaven's storehouse. Spirit of Prophecy says prayer is the key in the hand of faith. 
that unlocks the storehouse of heaven. This is the principle that was behind the obedient life of Jesus. Every day he did that. And the Lord didn't have to give him an alarm clock. The Father woke him up day, morning by morning. Sometimes I've woken up in the morning and I rub my eyes and go and go back to sleep. But not, not Jesus. Sometimes he spends whole nights in communion with his Father. But when he didn't, the Father woke him up. The third element in this salvation process is the gospel. God gives grace. Faith is a gift to us, but the gospel comes to us. Now, what is the gospel? It's the means. It's the means that God uses by which he can touch our hearts. When we hear the gospel, what, what, what does it do to us? Somebody loves me, right? It's called in the Bible the glad tidings, the good news. We hear the gospel and the Holy Spirit introduces us to Jesus. We can have that privilege every morning, every day. And when the gospel was proclaimed in the house of Cornelius, there was a house full of Gentiles, a Roman soldier, a few of Peter's friends came with him from Jerusalem. And uh, as they responded to the gospel, the gospel, remember, is the means. As they responded to the gospel, the Holy Spirit was poured out of all, all of them. That's, the Bible says all of them. It's amazing to me. You know, sometimes we struggle as we try to introduce Jesus to people. There are a lot of preconceived ideas out there. <clears throat> somebody said in the Sabbath school class this morning, I'd rather somebody didn't know anything sometimes. And just hear the pure words of truth for the very first time. Like having a clean white piece of paper and writing for the very first time, right? You don't have a lot of, uh, you know, all of us have a lot of bag baggage, really, don't we? I know in my life I've had to unlearn a lot of things and had to learn a lot of things. I'm still unlearning things. But um, this becomes more and more important to us as time goes on. The power comes by way of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 talks about, about the power. They'd just been asking, when are you going to set up your kingdom? He said, all power is given. I want you to go tell people about the kingdom. It's not important that we know the exact day is coming. It's kind of a little light rebuke to the disciples that day. But the power resides in the gospel. It's the means. Let's look at it. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. I'd like to invite you to feast yourself on the letter to the Romans. Every one of these letters fills a need that that church had. The Galatians had a need, right? The Roman church had a need, and their need was to hear the gospel. <laughs> I think they were beginning to go on a kind of a works program on the Lord, right? Notice what it says here, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein. That's an important word in this passage. For therein. Where's the, where's the in? In the gospel. He's been talking about the gospel, right? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Now that's the passage that uh, borrowed from Habakkuk, I think, 2, four, two verse 4. I see Steve going like this. I'm kind of looking to him for a minute. <laughs> that passage is really rendered, the just shall live by their hanging on. Hanging on to, on to what? <laughs> hanging on to Jesus. This is a faith walk, right? Hanging on to Jesus. It's the gospel that inspires and teaches us to love God. It's the gospel that teaches us the life of Christ, how more and more every day we can be like Jesus. The Bible says that we are saved by his life as well as his death. He lived a perfect life. We call that the righteousness of Christ. And it was developed in our organism for, th for 30 years, 33 years, as he daily 
gave his life to the Father. Now Romans 1, verses 1 to, five, 1 to 4, maybe 1 to 5. Romans chapter 1. One of the definitions of the gospel. Remember, the gospel is the means. Grace is the source. Faith is the method, the hand that reaches out to God. The gospel is the means. Let's notice it here. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. This is verse 1, Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning, and he's talking about the gospel, or the, the subject here is the gospel. And then it says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I read someplace in some inspired writings that uh, hanging on the cross, Jesus is the gospel. He's the good news, right? Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made according to seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. That's the gospel. It's the message concerning Jesus, his death, Burial, resurrection. If you want to read a really good uh, definition, of the, definition of the gospel, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. We won't have time to turn there. But it, uh, it defines the gospel very succinctly. This is the means by which we have salvation. The Holy Spirit always powerfully points us to Jesus, who is the gospel. I'd like to have us turn to John chapter 16, where it's talking about the Holy Spirit and his role in this, in this uh, development of faith for us. Starting with verse 15. This is John 16, verse 15. 13, I'm sorry. 13 to 15. John 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He, will, he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He will glorify me. What is the Holy Spirit's work? To show us Jesus. Okay. He will glorify me, for he, will, he will, shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. He's the great shower. The Holy Spirit is the great shower. This is his role in the plan of salvation, to show us Jesus. He shows us Jesus. We'll have faith. All things that, that the Father hath are mine. This is verse 15. Therefore said I, he shall take of mine, and he will do what? Show it to you, he's the great shower. Amazing, amazing things. The fourth link in this salvation idea, remember, grace is the source. It comes from God's heart. Faith is the means, a method, I'm sorry, the method by which we lay hold of Christ. The gospel is the means. Now the fourth leg of this, of this uh, chair is our lives are the evidence. You know, the Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith, right? But we're judged by what? works how can that be <laughs> simply because there will be evidence in the life of the believer and the Lord looks at the evidence he knows that we have faith in Jesus when he sees the evidence in our lives the evidence of the gospel has taken root in our in our heart and it is and it is the life we live it's the fruit of faith of Jesus the fruit fruit of the faith of Jesus the precious fruit. You know, Jesus looks for the precious fruit. I want to encourage you today. First of all, spend some time with Jesus and his word every day and develop a prayer life. Develop a prayer life. This is our response to him. 
It's not a works program. It's our response to him. Uh, and uh, sometimes we might not feel like we're very willing to do that. So maybe we need to ask, our, ask the Lord, Lord, make us willing to be willing to develop a prayer life. You'll get fresh glimpses of Jesus as you abide in his word. That's the secret of the faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. So then faith cometh by hearing, and the word of hearing by the word of God. Give yourself to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. Then believe that you're accepted. Don't go by feelings here. If you have given your heart to Jesus in a sincere way, then believe that he accepts you. Don't let the devil uh, kick, this, kick, kick it over. Believe that you're accepted. Romans 6.11 says, Reckon ye yourselves indeed to be dead unto sin. Believe it. We sing the song, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Sometimes we don't feel like that. Discouragements come. But we don't live by feelings. If we don't feel willing, when temptations come, then it's time to pray, Lord, make me willing to be willing. If you don't feel like opening the Bible, what do you do? Pray. <laughs> and be found in him through the word. There's therefore now no condemnation to those that are where? In Christ Jesus, yeah. We're not saved apart from that. We're not saved out here someplace by ourselves. We're saved in the person of another, in Christ. Paul uses that expression many, many times. No condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus because there's no condemnation in Jesus. The Father, look, when we give ourselves to him, the Father looks at us though we had never ever sinned. It's a great definition of justification, which simply means forgiveness, full and complete. He forgives us every day. That's justification. We could, God looks at us as though the righteous, God looks us through, at us through the righteousness of Christ, as though we had never sinned. Justification. It doesn't come by human effort. It comes by looking to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Justification is not some appendage that adds on to something great, but rather it is that which is great. That's what justification is. Justified believers are forgiven believers. We need that every moment of every day. We need it at the beginning of the pathway and we need it at the end of the pathway just as much as we did at the beginning. Our sins should go beforehand into what? Judgment, okay. We're living in the day of atonement. When the priest is going to take the sins out of the sanctuary and put them on the head of the scapegoat. And guess what? We call that the blotting out of sins. And then a great time of trouble comes to Remove the earthiness, and then we'll be ready for Jesus to come. These are all things that prepare for this. Forgiveness is huge. None of us would be here this morning if it were not for the forgiveness of God. Every day. <clears throat> in James chapter 3, it says, In many things we all offend. That's in the present continuous tense. In many things we all offend every day. I have to ask myself, who did I offend this morning? Probably have. Justification, forgiveness is like a rainbow hovering over our heads. And under that rainbow of promise, we have the privilege of growing into Christ as we learn of him from his word every day. Justification is something that true believers need and appreciate for the whole journey. It's like the main, mainspring. Is Theo here this morning? <laughs> there he is. <laughs> a mainspring. <laughs> Theo is a jeweler. He knows what a main, mainspring does. It runs the whole thing, doesn't it? The old alarm clocks and the old watches. Now everything's electronic now and digital, but the old clock... Justification is the mainspring. Justification means that we know that we've been forgiven. 
that the grace of God has been applied to our hearts. And now more than anything else in this world, we want to be what he says we already are in him. What a motivation to live a holy life. It involves the death of Christ as well as his perfect life as our substitute and surety. It drives the Christian experience like the mainspring of a watch. Without the mainspring, nothing works. Spirit of Prophecy has written that justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. I wonder why she didn't say justification by faith is, or sanctification by faith is our, is the third angel's message in verity. Why didn't she say that? She didn't say it that way. Justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. You can't put the, the cart before the horse. Justification is the primary thing. It's the big thing. It's that which is truly great in the Christian experience because the sinners feel forgiven. And uh, you can't, uh, and, then, and then sanctification is the fruit of all of that. We need forgiveness constantly. Justification is something that true believers need and appreciate for the whole journey. It involves the death of Christ as well as his perfect life. It drives the Christian experience. I'm trying to say this as many ways as I know how this morning. Because nothing works unless there's a mainspring. And justification is that. The gratitude that wells up in the hearts of a forgiven person is what makes us want to, want to serve Jesus every day. Sanctification is never complete in this life, but justification is because Jesus is full and complete. The great error that Luther fought so hard against, so, so boldly, even to the death for him, he almost died a couple of times, was uh, that the church in the medieval times was teaching that sanctification and justification were kind of blended together. That's a terrible evil. In fact, it is the heartbeat of the, of the Antichrist that sanctification and justification are the same thing. They must not be confused and they must, and they, and they must not be mixed up nor can they be separated because one is the fruit of the other one. It's like two oars of a boat. We cannot have sanctification without being justified believers. Nor can you long be a justified believer if you shut away the Holy Spirit and, do, and shut out the life of sanctification that he wants to provide for us. Justification by faith. The great controversy says justification by faith, which Martin Luther taught so clearly. A number of years ago, I set out on a journey searching the penned words of Martin Luther to find out what he taught so clearly. I think it's good to go to the source of things, don't you think so? Lo, I found such a universe of spiritual love and acceptance uh, that I could hardly contain it. No wonder that justification by faith is the third angel's message in verity. This is what we have to share with the world. Forgiveness. There's a world out there that is, is dying of guilt. Paul got it directly from Jesus, and Luther got it from Paul. And uh, it's so wonderfully stated. Many words of Paul that uh, have been a mystery to me now have made me uh, have see it as perfect sense. Those who keep God's commandments in the faith of Jesus are justified believers by the grace of God. They have been declared righteous before the law of God because of Christ's life and his death. We owe everything to him. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to his what? Cross I cling. That's where the power is. We could read some more texts about that. 
uh, and the cross is the, where the power of God is. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18. But my time is gone. I've got about 25 pages left. You want to hear those? I've done, I've done three. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we need to draw this to a close. But I want to just say this. There may be someone here today who has not given your heart to Jesus in a meaningful way and been forgiven and are justified and have the joy of the Lord in your mind. There may be somebody like that here today. Don't prolong that decision. Then seal that decision by be prepared, be, being prepared to be baptized. That's the seal of that decision. This is God's way. And having this seal, the Lord knows them are those that are his. All this rests on the faith of Jesus. Dear Father in heaven, our prayer this morning is that each of us develop within our hearts the faith of Jesus. We know this is our only way out of this world alive. And uh, you have made it so plain in your word. So I pray this morning that you'll be with each person here, that each person will receive a blessing, a unique blessing that each one needs. Make us ready, Lord, for your coming. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.